This video is supported by Skillshare. On May 21st, 1927, Charles Lindbergh landed his plane the Spirit of St. Louis at La Bourget Aerodrome in Paris, and would forever be known as the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic. And later on in his life, he would be known as kind of a Nazi. To be fair, he was more of a Nazi sympathizer and was super into eugenics and crazy race theories and stuff. So, I mean, not like a real Nazi, but, you know. A little bit of a Nazi. But rampant anti-Semitism aside, most people think of Charles Lindbergh as a daring adventurer who flew across the Atlantic to push the bounds of humanity and test the limits of technology when, in fact, he was after some cash. There were a lot of people trying to fly across the Atlantic at that time. It was like the Mount Everest of aviation, and it was because of the Ortigue Prize, which was a $25,000 prize to anybody who could fly from New York to Paris or vice versa. Lindbergh won the $25,000, but really we all won because various teams around the world spent over $400,000 on new aviation technologies. This prize really pushed aviation forward in that day. Flash forward 69 years to 1996 when billionaire uh, Peter Diamandis set up the XPRIZE Foundation inspired by the Ortigue Prize. Their first prize was for $10 million to the first private company that could launch a crewed aircraft into space, space being above the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers above sea level. And in October 2004, that prize was finally won when Burt Rutan and his company Scale Composites launched their vehicle, Spaceship One, into the history books. Spaceship One was a small rocket-propelled craft that was carried up to a high altitude by a large jet-powered plane called White Knight. White Knight would carry it up to 14 kilometers, at which point it would drop Spaceship One, it lights its rocket engine, and accelerates up into space. Once it reached its maximum height, it glided back down and landed on a runway, so unlike most rockets, it took off like a plane and landed like a plane. This was a really big deal, the first time a private company put a human being into space, and fittingly, you can today find Spaceship One hanging from the ceiling at the National Air and Space Museum right next to, you guessed it, the Spirit of St. Louis. Today there are multiple private space launch companies, all of them focusing in one way or another on reusability in order to save costs, but interestingly none of them are using this space plane idea, which is 100% reusable. With the exception of Virgin Galactic, who basically bought the design for Spaceship One, but they haven't really begun operations yet, and none of their flights have crossed the Kármán line. The reasons for this can basically be summed up as a bunch of technical hurdles that we're going to have to overcome if we're going to make a space plane idea work, but there is a new technology that's being developed right now that might overcome those obstacles. It's called the Skylon space plane, and if it works, it might be the next big leap in space travel. The idea of a reusable space plane has been popular since almost the very beginning of the space age. In 1966, only five years after Alan Shepard rode a ballistic missile up into the sky, the Air Force and NASA concluded a study on what they called the Integrated Launch and Reentry Vehicle, or ILRV. They would later call this design the Space Transportation System, or STS, but to the rest of us, it went by a different name. The Space Shuttle. Pretty much everything you need to know about the Space Shuttle you can see right there in its name. Space Shuttle, Space Transportation System. The whole point of it was to be a reusable and cheap ride to space for both people and cargo. And look, it was a gorgeous vehicle that inspired an entire generation of people. I had a poster of the Space Shuttle up on my wall. I built little models of the Space Shuttle, and I might or might not have seen the movie Space Camp about 500 times. Mark my words, someday I'm going to start an 80s retro wave band called Jinx But Max in Space. In so many ways, the Space Shuttle program was a massive success. Over 30 years, the five different shuttle orbiters performed 134 successful missions. Being an integral part of assembling the International Space Station, it launched and repaired the Hubble Space Telescope. I could go on and on. But two of those five orbiters went up in flames in two of the worst space disasters in history, killing 14 astronauts. And beyond that, it never actually achieved its goal of cheap, reusable flight. Even with the fact that it was reusable, the cost of launching the space shuttle was astronomical. Pun intended. The average cost of each launch was somewhere in the ballpark of a billion dollars, and it really wasn't so much reusable as refurbishable. For example, uh, every time between launches they had to replace every one of the 20,000 heat tiles on the underside of the shuttle. I won't go into detail as to why the shuttle failed to meet its expectations, but I'll kick you over to Amy Shira Teetle, who did a video about why she's not really a fan of the space shuttle. She goes into all those details. Don't hold that against her. But even the shuttle and the Soviet Buran, which never quite actually got off the ground, still took off vertically. They may have landed like a plane, but they took off like a rocket. But what if you could have a vehicle that could take off like a plane and land like a plane, an actual orbital space plane? 
That's the idea behind Skylon. A space plane has been in development by a company called Reaction Engines out of the UK since 1989. Skylon is what they call a HOTOL vehicle, which stands for Horizontal Takeoff and Landing. It was originally a joint venture between British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce, though Rolls-Royce eventually pulled out of the project. Left without a partner to build the engine, rocket scientists Alan Bond, Richard Varville, and John Scott Scott continued with the project, basing the vehicle around a pre-cooled hybrid air-breathing rocket engine that Alan Bond designed called SABRE, which stands for Synergetic Air-Breathing Rocket Engine. The biggest challenge for a space plane is just simply having enough fuel to get up to orbit. Planes fly by pushing air around, either by propellers or jet engines, but at a certain height, the air is too thin for that to work anymore, so at that point they have to kick on some rocket engines to get it up actually into space. The problem is the same rocket equation that plagues all launches. You know, you have to have a certain amount of fuel to get up into space. If you add more fuel, that adds more weight, which means you need more fuel, which adds more weight. It's this crazy catch-22. And the specific problem with space planes is that they don't go straight up. They go on a very horizontal trajectory. The White Knight, for example, flies for about an hour before it finally drops Spaceship One, and then it burns its rocket engine for like 134 seconds. So this is where the air-breathing part of Sabre comes in. The Sabre engine is designed to suck in air just like a jet engine up to a height of about 26 kilometers using a pre-cooler to both keep the engine from overheating but also, and here's the genius part, liquefies oxygen which it then stores in tanks as locks. So that by the time it reaches that 26 kilometer limit where the jet engine can't keep the plane aloft anymore, it then transformed like an Autobot into rocket mode using its stored liquid oxygen as fuel. This is a little bit of a hack around the rocket equation because you don't have to take off from the ground with all the fuel you'll need. You'll actually create fuel as you climb. The pre-cooler is the secret sauce to the engine because friction and compression become a problem with any plane flying over Mach 3. And the Skylon's engines wouldn't kick on until around Mach 5, so the temperature could reach thousands of degrees. According to the BBC, in a recent test, the Sabre pre-cooler was able to quench a stream of gases that were heated to 420 degrees in 1 20th of a second. And these temperature extremes have required the use of advanced materials that really have only been feasible in the last few years. Basically, this pre-cooler would allow the Skylon to fly faster than an SR-71 Blackbird, which topped out at around Mach 3.3. And in rocket mode, it would generate enough thrust to launch 12 tons of cargo up to the International Space Station. Now all of this sounds super exciting, but before we crack open the champagne, let's be clear-eyed about the fact that we're talking about a single stage to orbit vehicle here, or an SSTO, which has been tried many, many, many times, and none have been successful. SSTOs are basically the Bigfoot of spaceflight. My buddy Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut, did a review of SSTO projects over on his channel uh, about a year or so ago. I say review, it was really more of a massacre. Um, space travel is pretty much littered with SSTO courses. Philip Bono, an engineer with Douglas Aircraft, designed a series of SSTOs starting in the 1960s. He was inspired in part by the work his company had done on the upper stage of the Saturn V. Variations of Bono's design included a reusable space tug able to tow a million pounds to orbit, a reusable craft for stranded astronauts, and a troop transport. Considering this was the height of the Cold War, I'm actually kind of surprised that one never went anywhere. Gary C. Hudson of Pacific American Launch Systems created several designs that have since become popular despite never actually getting off the ground. His Phoenix SSTOs could carry cargo or crew and were going to be powered by an aerospike engine, which is another aerospace pipe dream. And yet another popular yet doomed SSTO was the McDonnell Douglas DCX, which was a component of the SDI program, also known as Star Wars. It was a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that was designed by a science fiction author that just coincidentally looked like something out of the Amazing Stories magazine covers. A lack of support from NASA eventually killed the DCX, but several of its engineers went on to work for Blue Origin, whose new Shepard vehicles bear a family resemblance to the older craft. SSTO designs are implemented and, and created and thought about for one real purpose only, and that is to get the cost of spaceflight down. The thing is, companies like SpaceX and Rocket Lab have already brought down the cost of launches considerably. Through more efficient and cheaper to make engines, reusability, and other rocket advancements, the, the whole advantage to an SSTO is getting smaller and smaller all the time. In fact, it may already be gone. In 2015, Ashley Dove J, a PhD researcher in aerospace engineering, estimated that the nominal cost per kilo for Skylon launch would land somewhere around 1800, while a partially reusable launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 could get down to just about $1,200. Note I'm giving dollars here while the original numbers were in British pounds. And then, of course, in the near future, SpaceX could be launching Starship, which is a 100% reusable vehicle and should bring costs down even more. This is not to say that Skylon can't or shouldn't be built. Even if it isn't something that's competitive in the orbital space, it could still be, you know, commercially viable as a jetliner. You could travel from New York to Paris in, like, two hours. Flying high and fast also has obvious military 
capabilities. This could be the natural descendant to the SR-71 Blackbird, although the military hasn't been really investing in this. The UK Space Agency and ESA have both contributed about 60 million pounds to the Skylon project and other individual uh, investments have brought it up to around 100 million pounds, uh, based mostly off of the pre-cooler. Reaction Engines has used that money to build a testing facility in the UK, and they also have a heat exchange facility in Colorado that's had some considerable successes. So, is Skylon gonna happen? Maybe? There have been some rumors that they've been considering a two-stage rocket that would fly up on a Sabre-powered aircraft and then launch something from there into orbit, which, I don't know, kind of defeats the purpose? There's reason to be skeptical of any potential SSTO. Uh, spacecraft for all the reasons that Tim talks about over in his video and I tend to fall into the category of somebody who thinks that you know some of the smartest people in the world are working on rocket flight and whatnot and if this is something that they haven't really tried before there's probably a good reason for that I mean of course nobody ever thought about landing a rocket until SpaceX just up and did it so who knows maybe there's a decent chance that Skyline will wind up revolutionizing um, air travel in some way. And if they can make money doing it, then yeah, we might be seeing a totally different kind of space race in the future. Maybe we need a single stage to orbit X Prize so that we can accelerate the advancement of Saber technology. And maybe someday, who knows, we'll see a Skylon hanging from the Air and Space Museum too. Reaction Engine started with just three guys and their crazy idea to do a transformable rocket engine. And SpaceX started with the Mariachi Band. Literally. Every company has a start somewhere, and if you've got an idea that you think could transform the world, I highly recommend the course Art of the Start, Turning Ideas into High Growth Businesses by Guy Kawasaki on Skillshare. Guy Kawasaki is a legend of the entrepreneurial and startup space, and in this course, he and co-presenter Bill Reichert walk you through the process of turning your idea into a business. Covering everything from starting, launching, fundraising, pitching, and even socializing, they help you to get your ducks in a row so you can focus on the big picture. In fact, by the end of the course, you'll have a 10-page presentation that's ready to show potential investors and partners and move your idea forward. And if you want, you can even share it with other class members for feedback. This is, of course, just one of 25,000 courses you can find on Skillshare in all kinds of subjects, art, marketing, lifestyle. You can even learn how to make the perfect grilled cheese. And if you sign up at skl.sh slash joescott10, you can get two free months of Skillshare, and after that, it's less than $10 a month. It's the cheapest tuition I've ever seen. Anyway, it's a great deal, it supports the channel, and who knows, you might learn something. So check out Skillshare, link is down in the description below. Alright, thanks to Skillshare for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to my answer files on Patreon that are building an awesome community, giving me some great ideas and feedback, and uh, I got some new people that have joined. I need to murder their names real quick. We've got, uh, I'm going to really murder this name, Kishore Tipernani, uh, who actually has a book that is right up here. It's called New Eden. He asked me to put it up here, and I did it, because I take care of my patrons. Uh, go check that out. I think it's on Amazon. So, uh, Kishore is on there. Thank you, Kishore. There's uh, Freak317, Nathan Schneck, Luke Padzowski, uh, Garol Dumrol, J. Rob, Ben Letvin, Michael Milnum, uh, <laughs> Cecile Tonglet, Jewel Gutierrez, Emir, and Eric George. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to early access to videos and access to me and Discord and just join all this whole thing that's going on, you can go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Also, new t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Uh, there's some really cool new stuff. This one is apparently pretty popular, so uh, Falcon 9, it'll be back. Terminator reference, you get it. Go check it out, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video because Google thinks you'll like that one or any of them down in the sidebar with my little face on it. And if you like them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday and every Thursday. All right, thanks again for watching. You guys go out now, have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.